Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. The year was 1521. Most of us shouldn't have been around by then. The Protestant Reformation was in full swing. And following the posting of the 95 Theses, Martin Luther was summoned by the Roman Emperor Charles V to speak before those assembled at the Diet, which means assembly, of Worms, a town in present-day Germany. And after being challenged on the books he owned and wrote, and the scripture he used to base his arguments, Luther was quoted as saying, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Tradition adds that Luther was also heard saying the words, Here I stand. I can do no other. What does it mean to truly take a stand and risk everything to suffer? Sometimes we can choose when to take a stand and other times we are born into circumstances that seem to be naturally brought upon us with such risk and potential suffering. One of today's most popular comedians, his name is Trevor Noah. Have any of you all heard of Trevor Noah before, maybe? He is this uh, comedian from South Africa and host of The Daily Show. And he has this joke where he says that white people in particular enjoy the idea of fake suffering. More as a hobby than anything else. It's like camping or running marathons. As long as it actually doesn't take away from any of their privileges and comforts in life. And within this humor is, is a lot of truth for many of us today, right? How many of us know what it means to truly take a stand, to risk everything? And furthermore, imagine what it's like to live every day as a minority in the United States with the challenges and suffering that accompanies simply being a person of color or living in poverty, identifying as homosexual or queer, or worshiping as a follower of a faith that's not Christianity. Now, I grew up with so many privileges in my life simply handed to me at birth. I am white, straight, young-ish, Christian American with an education and a career with a pension. This past year, I was researching seminaries to start my doctoral work, and I found what I considered to be the best of the best in a church leadership programs led by a fantastic pastor and professor and church leader at one of the leading seminaries in the country, Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I would be working toward a doctor of ministry degree, joining the only 4% of Americans with doctorate degrees. And this plan was all going very well until I received a mass email from the seminary president, to the Fuller community that shared news of a lawsuit against the seminary. It seems that a homosexual student 
was expelled for marrying her same-sex partner, which was in violation of the Fuller community standards. As someone who values the inclusion and celebration of people of all orientations into all aspects of life, my heart was broken for this person going through this experience. And this also broke my heart because now I was being asked to choose how to respond to what I consider an injustice. How do I respond as a student who is now affiliated with the seminary? How do I respond as a pastor who seeks to share such values of inclusion and others who may otherwise feel marginalized and unwelcome by the church? How do I respond as a Christian? I would have to leave. And over the next few weeks, I prayed and I met with individuals who I considered mentors, colleagues, and friends. And all of this confirmed what I felt the Spirit was nudging me to do. This past week, I formally withdrew as a student from Fuller. And I'll seek to transfer to a seminary that's more in line with my beliefs and values. I would like for us this morning to imagine what it means to take a stand. To put ourselves and others at risk for the sake of a larger purpose in this world. Today's scripture reading is just that, a, a tale of a young, vulnerable couple who found themselves risking everything in the name of following the God they loved. And so we hear these words once again from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, and before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's imagine in this moment the risk involved for Mary and Joseph at this time. Mary, a teenage girl, now found herself miraculously pregnant. On many occasions, this would be cause for celebration, but, but not for a young, unwed Jewish girl. There were rules against such things, and the public outcry and shame would be immediate and severe. And Joseph found himself in a different type of situation. Here he is, trying to get his life in order with a career and the news of an upcoming marriage to celebrate and prepare for. I imagine he is excited and a bit anxious about the next chapter in his life. And he's a good man. The text reads that he is a righteous man. And all of a sudden, he learns that his engaged wife-to-be is pregnant. I'm sure he struggled with this news. What was the appropriate response? What was the right thing to do? And the reading continues that he was unwilling to expose her to public disgrace and planned to dismiss her quietly. I'm sure he would have been gravely disappointed with all that was happening, but in his estimation, that was the honorable thing to do. And then God arrived on the scene. Verse 20, once again, but just when Joseph had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The moment came for both Mary and Joseph to take a stand. How could they continue to live as people of faith and integrity with such a dangerous new reality in their lives? Were they willing to risk their futures for the sake of this child? What does it mean to faithfully follow the will of God when we risk the privileges and comforts of the lives we have come to know as our daily reality? Where does one stand when the world seems to turn upside down and things are not as they should be? Friends, the good news for the beginning of the Christmas story this morning is that God calls for us all to take a stand in the name of God's kingdom and God will provide. God provided for Abraham as he was led to a new home and a new land. God provided for the Israelites as they fled slavery through the wilderness. God provided for those in exile and as they were called to build once again. God provided for Mary and for Joseph. And God provides for all of us with news of the coming Messiah, Jesus the Christ, who will save us from our sins. Now, I didn't risk much in withdrawing from Fuller Seminary. There are many other people who just by living as who they were created to be, daily risk so much more than I can ever imagine. But in this experience, I know that I am being called to take a stand for what I believe in, even if it means some discomfort or inconveniences or even sacrifice. What will you stand for? What will we stand for as Valley Community? Each of us, regardless of where we come out on particular political or theological topics, are called to take a stand. And I'm not here to tell you what or how to believe. As Presbyterians, we celebrate the freedom of conscience that comes with living spirit-led lives. But I'm here to tell you today that we as Christians are called to live for something far much greater than our own comforts and privileges in this world. We are called to live beyond our retirement funds, our vacation homes, and our landscaped yards. We're even called to live beyond our patriotism, our religious structures and churches, our sense of what is normal in our daily living. We are called in every breath that we take to point to Jesus, to point to the empty cross, to point to God's kingdom That is our ultimate reality, where we will spend eternity and where we will experience true salvation. Today we celebrate the coming of the Christ child in just a few days. This is a moment of ultimate joy and peace throughout the entire world. But today, for just a moment, may we be reminded of the risk and sacrifice it takes to faithfully follow Christ in our lives. So where do we stand today? How will our lives reflect such values and priorities? How will we usher in the Savior of this world? Thanks be to God who continually calls us to so much more. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done. Amen.